Bona tarda, benvinguts, good afternoon, welcome to everybody. Soc Eduard Tarruga, el president de la Societat Catalana d'Economia. Dins de la societat tenim un grup de treball que es diu d'Economia Ecològica i Política Ambiental, que coordina i presideix, de fet, el professor Joan Martínez Alier i que ens ha convocat avui per parlar del tema que tenim escrit a la pissarra amb la participació del professor Jason Hickel. Us agraeixo a tots la presència. Us estimulo a que continueu estudiant i treballant aquests temes. La Societat Catalana d'Economia està molt interessada en aquest tema. De fet, el grup d'Economia Ecològica i Política Ambiental és un dels grups de treball més actius que tenim aquí i estem segurs que no sols perquè el tema és d'una importància capital en els moments actuals, sinó perquè inclús en altres moments també ho seria, doncs creiem que hem de treballar en aquest tema cara al futur. Us anuncio simplement perquè ho sapigueu que el proper dia 27 tindrem una, 27 d'octubre, tindrem una conferència sobre un tema que és també d'interès, que és la reducció del temps de treball i la jornada laboral de quatre dies. Punt i seguit, una oportunitat per la transformació econòmica i social. Vosaltres estic segur que també amb el tema de la transformació econòmica i social i mediambiental també hi esteu interessats. Aquesta sessió tindrà lloc el dia 27 d'octubre a les 6 de la tarda a càrrec del professor Joan Sanxís i Muñoz, que és professor associat del Departament d'Economia Aplicada de la Universitat de València. Aquest és el tema. Després d'aquesta sessió us convido també que el dia 3 de novembre l'Institut de Ciència i Tecnologia Ambiental de la Universitat Autònoma de Barcelona, a Vella Terra, retrà un homenatge molt merescut a la persona que tinc aquí a la meva esquerra, el professor Joan Martínez Alier. Crec que és un homenatge molt merescut, sobretot per la seva trajectòria personal i professional. És un gran expert en els temes amb els que estudia, que a més els estudia molt a consciència i a més crea escola. Per tant, Joan, et felicito enormement pels premis que has rebut i per aquest homenatge que rebràs, repeteixo, el dia 3 de novembre a Vella Terra, a la Universitat Autònoma. Jo avui no vull parlar més de la conferència ni del professor Jason Hickel. Això és un treball que deixo en mans d'en Joan Martínez Alier. Jo, quan comenci l'explicació, em permetreu que segui enmig vostre, perquè des de baix us seguiré molt més tranquil·lament que des d'aquí, que encara que tingui... Aquí tenim un ordinador en el que es projecta el mateix, és millor sempre sentir-ho més mirant la cara del conferenciant i veure directament l'exposició. Moltes gràcies, repeteixo, moltes gràcies a tots. I si podeu, us animo a que es feu socis de la Societat Catalana d'Economia. És una entitat filial de l'Institut d'Estudis Catalans. La quota és molt alta, són 50 euros l'any. Perdó, 40, no? 40, em corregeix el senyor secretari, Xavier Ferriols. 40, jo ja pensava en augmentar-ho per la inflació. Bé, vull dir, 40 euros l'any. I us animo perquè us ho passareu bé amb les activitats que fem. Veureu que tractem molts temes d'economia, economia i societat, economia i Catalunya, ciència econòmica i també economia ecològica i política ambiental. Moltes gràcies. I Joan, tens la paraula. El que em toca a mi és presentar Jason Hickel i perquè entengui el que dic, perquè ho faré en anglès, no? Que és la conferència, es farà en anglès. I... So, I have to introduce you. This is the... What we have... But it will be very short because the time is going on and we have only one hour and a half. 
including the, the discussion at the end. Well, Jason Hickel, for alguna raons que jo conec bastant de prop, però molt excepcionals, viu ara a Barcelona, uh, I said it in English. He came to Barcelona with one of these uh, uh, contracts called Beatriz de Galindo, who era una senyor, era, she was a lady from the 16th century who taught Latin to Juana la Loca. But whatever the name of the, of the position he has, of Beatriz de Galindo, and there are other in, other in the universities in Spain, is a contract for some years, and well, we really hope, I really hope he will stay for longer. But for the time being, he's here, and he's at the ICTA of the, of the Autonomous University, uh, and George Scalis is also there, and there are a group of perhaps 15, 20 people who are, and um, very few are economists, some are biologists, engineers, and so on, and working on what we could call ecological macroeconomics, but with a lot of emphasis on uh, degrowth. So that's what he's going to talk about, and the title is very explicit. He gave me the chance of choosing two titles. I chose the one who, who is more sort of attractive. And you have attracted more people than usually come to our meetings, to tell the truth. And I am told there are other people in, at home also following. So it's up to you now. You have a great reputation, as we all know. George Scalis, if I can say again what I said in, as a joke a few days ago in the <coughs> university, turned 50 years old just a month ago. And, and Jason Hickel is about to be 40 years old, isn't it? Or you are already, which is very impressive, isn't it? Very impressive because, well, it's about half your life, but anyway, it's impressive of so many things that he has done. So this is also a great satisfaction to see that, well, people from outside Catalonia are coming here, uh, attracted not only because of the sun and the and the beach and so on, but also because uh, we have created, in fact, a group, or it has created itself, a group which uh, has a little association called Research and Degrowth, and you can also become members of this if you want, and that's it, more or less. So I think that if we have at the end like 10 minutes for questions, would be good, or 15, whatever you say. Thank you. Thank you for coming here, because I know that you, you have been in many other places, perhaps with more public than here, and but this is what the city can offer. <laughs> Congratulations, and thank you for your presence and for your speech. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the very kind introduction. Uh, it's, it's really an honor for me to be here, and especially in this uh, really beautiful room. So um, just to give you a very quick overview of what I'm going to do, I'm not going to give a typical talk uh, on degrowth. Instead, uh, I'm going to focus here on describing the colonial dimensions of the world capitalist system and the ecological crisis that it is causing and discussing the anti-colonial dimensions of degrowth theory and policy. I'm going to argue that addressing the crisis of ecological breakdown that we face and moreover doing it in a way that is socially just will require degrowth in the rich countries of the, globe, of the global north, which in turn will require a transition out of capitalism. So they've told me to speak for 50 to 60 minutes, which is a bit long, so I hope I can hold your attention for this, for this time. We're going to cover a lot of territory, uh, but, um, but I think if we're able to focus, it should be rewarding, I hope. Okay, so first, um, I want to start out by setting out where we are at with respect to the most prominent dimension of the ecological crisis, which is climate breakdown. We're presently at 1.1 degrees of global warming, and even at this level, of course, the effects are disastrous. Extreme storms, droughts, heat waves, wildfires. Our media tend to focus mostly on the damages that occur in the global north, but I want to emphasize that the vast majority of the impact is being inflicted on the territories of the global south. Already, 30 million people are being displaced each year by climate breakdown, triggering major social and political upheaval. For these people, climate apocalypse is not some abstract future possibility. It's already here. 
Now we know that to stay under 1.5 degrees, as per the Paris agreements, global emissions have to be cut in half by 2030, that's the green line in this graph, declining dramatically from historical trends. But so far, government pledges are nowhere near this target. Most people are not aware of this fact, but even if all countries uphold the pledges they've made, global emissions will not decline at all over the coming decade. And that reality is represented in, the, uh, in this graph by the blue line. And by the way, this does account for new pledges made in Glasgow. Moreover, right now, existing government policies have us on track for about 3.2 degrees of global heating by the end of the century, so in the lifetime of present generations. This is obviously way over the target. It represents a profound failure of our governments and of our international system and portends a very dangerous future indeed. So what will the world look like with three degrees of heating? I'm going to give just very briefly an overview of some of the existing science on this. We know that sea levels are projected to rise one to two meters, which would swamp many coastal regions and coastal cities and significantly exacerbate coastal storm damage. Some 30 to 50% of species on our planet are likely to be wiped out, a figure that is to me almost too horrifying to contemplate. More than 1.5 billion people could be displaced from their home regions by climate impacts, triggering migration on a scale that really dwarfs anything we've yet experienced. And the yields of staple crops are likely to decline, to the point where the UN warns, and I quote, of multi-breadbasket failure and sustained food supply disruptions globally, with famines potentially affecting several regions at once. This is why scientists so frequently warn that three degrees is not compatible with organized human civilization as we know it. That is the reality we face. That's the future we're headed toward. And climate change is not the only crisis we confront. This reality tends to fall out of our media discourse, but it's important. The global economy is presently overshooting five other planetary boundaries, including land system change, uh, which is driving deforestation and habitat destruction. Excess fertilizer use from industrial monoculture, which depletes soils and poisons water ecosystems. Water depletion, due mostly to industrial extraction. Chemical pollution and species extinction, which is perhaps most concerning. Right now, the rate of species extinction is around 1,000 times faster than prior to the Industrial Revolution. When the latest UN report on biodiversity was published, the executive secretary summarized it by saying, and I quote, we are currently in a systematic manner exterminating all non-human living beings. People have a tendency to refer to this crisis using the language of the Anthropocene. And of course, this terminology is useful to highlight the fact that for the first time in geological history, human activity is dramatically reshaping our planet and our climate. But it's also incorrect. It's not humans as such that are causing this problem. Rather, it is being driven by our economic system, capitalism, and is caused almost entirely by a small number of rich countries in the global north, primarily to the benefits of their elites and corporations. Now, it's important to be clear about what we mean by capitalism here. Okay? When people think of capitalism, they often think of uh, markets and trade and businesses. But markets and trade and even businesses existed for thousands of years before capitalism and are, in are innocent enough on their own. What distinguishes capitalism from other economic systems is that it is organized around and dependent on constant expansion, perpetually increasing levels of industrial production and consumption, which we have come to measure in terms of GDP growth, right? It's the first intrinsically expansionary system in history. If this system doesn't grow, it crashes into crisis, which we experience every few years with terrible consequences for ordinary people. Crucially, under capitalism, the purpose of increasing production is not primarily to meet concrete human needs for things like housing or healthcare or nutritious food. It's not about use value or social progress. Rather, it is primarily to extract and accumulate an ever-increasing quantity of profit. That is the overriding objective. And this process, let's call it growthism, has no identifiable endpoints. Indeed, the dominant assumption in economics, if you can believe it, is that growth along these lines should carry on indefinitely, that every industry 
every sector, every national economy should continue to increase production, reg regardless of whether or not we actually need it to, every year, and regardless of how, how rich a country has become. Such a system is obviously irrational at the best of times, and right now I'm sure you'll agree, in the middle of a climate emergency, it's clearly madness. The problem is that growth doesn't come out of thin air. It's a process of production, which entails the use of energy and materials, and these have ecological impacts. In general, the more you produce, the more energy and resources you use than would otherwise be the case under any given technological regime. Okay. Now, it's important to grasp that the world economy is characterized by an extraordinary inequality in the use of energy and materials. Let's focus here on energy for a moment, okay? High-income countries, which are on the right here, use vastly more energy than the rest of the world, several times more than what would be required to meet human needs at a good standard, and also well in excess of what is compatible with the Paris Agreement target of staying under 1.5 degrees, right? So why is it that rich economies have such extreme levels of production and energy use, while at the same time large numbers of their own citizens cannot make ends meet? In the USA, 40% of people do not have, uh, have affordable health care. In the UK, 4.3 million children live in poverty. It appears to be a paradox. And the reason, of course, is that because under capitalism, decisions about what to produce, how to use resources, and who benefits from the surplus that we generate. All of this is controlled by a small number of extremely wealthy individuals, the 1% who own the majority of corporate shares and who elect the directors of firms, right? And of course, what they do is they decide that we should produce things that maximize their profits, things like advertising and SUVs and fossil fuels, rather than things like public health care and public transit. The result is that we have a system that simultaneously overuses resources and still at the same time fails to meet people's basic needs. This is a major problem. Now, the consequences of excess resource use in the core is that these countries are also responsible for the vast majority of the excess emissions that are presently causing climate breakdown. And this is where things get quite disturbing. In a recent paper published in The, La in the Lancet Planetary Health, we measured each nation's cumulative emissions in excess of their fair share of the carbon budget that is, as, that is associated with a safe planetary boundary, right, which is 350 parts per million concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere, which was exceeded in 1990. The results are displayed in this graph. We found that the USA alone is responsible for 40% of excess emissions. In other words, 40% of all of the damages caused by climate breakdown all around the world. The Global North as a group, which includes the USA, Canada, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, Israel, and Japan, is responsible for 92%. That's the area represented here in the dark green. Meanwhile, the entire continents of Africa, Asia, and Latin America, home to the vast majority of the world's population, are responsible for only 8% of excess emissions. That's the green portion of this graph. And most of the countries in the Global South, including big nations like India, Indonesia and Nigeria are still well within their fair share of the planetary boundary and have therefore not contributed to the problem at all. I argue that we should understand this reality as a process of atmospheric colonization. The atmosphere is a shared commons on which all of us depend for our existence. Rich countries and their corporations have appropriated it for their own enrichments with devastating consequences for all of life on Earth. Meanwhile, the Global South, which has done very little to cause this problem, suffers 82 to 92% of all of the economic costs and damages inflicted by climate breakdown, and suffers 98 to 99% of all climate-related deaths. In other words, virtually all climate-related mortality is occurring in the territories of the Global South. It would be difficult to overstate the scale of this injustice. We can see this inverse relationship very clearly if we look at a map showing which countries are most responsible for excess emissions and then compare it to a map showing which countries are most vulnerable to climate impacts. So the red nations here are those that have contributed most to causing the problem, 
As you can see, it's overwhelmingly the countries of the global north that I've mentioned. In this second map, the red nations are the ones that are most vulnerable to the impacts of climate breakdown. And as you can see, it is overwhelmingly the countries of the global south that are affected. Indeed, the two maps are almost an exact inversion of one another. In other words, not only is climate breakdown being driven by processes of atmospheric colonization, it is also that the consequences are playing out along colonial lines. If we are not attentive to the obvious colonial dimensions of the climate crisis, we're missing the point. I also want to show you very briefly this map. This comes from a recent paper in the journal Nature Climate Change, and it shows the geographical uh, uh, distribution of deadly climate conditions at two to three degrees of global warming. The yellow regions will experience around 100 days of deadly heat per year, and the red regions will experience around 300 days of deadly heat. As you can see, much of the global south will be plunged into, condi into conditions so extreme as to render large parts of the tropics more or less uninhabitable for humans without large outlays of cooling infrastructure. For these regions, 3.2 degrees is a death sentence. And again, this is the future we're headed toward unless we can bring about a dramatic change in direction. Okay, let's talk about materials a little bit where similar dynamics are at play. This graph shows global material use over the past half century. The total weight of metals and cement and forests, fish, fossil fuels, all of the materials that the economy extracts and consumes each year. The red line in the graph is what industrial, industrial ecologists suggest is the maximum sustainable level, okay? About 50 billion tons per year. As you can see, we shot past that threshold in the late 1990s. And resource use is in turn being driven by our pursuit of economic growth. There's a coupling between GDP and material flows. For the past half century, economists have promised that more efficient technology and a shift to services would decouple growth from material use. But in fact, the opposite has happened. Over the past two decades, a recoupling has occurred. The global economy has become more resource intensive, not less. And as of 2020, we're now consuming 100 billion tons per year, overshooting the, the, the boundary by a factor of two. Right? This is a problem because material use is the single biggest driver of ecosystem damage and is responsible for about 90% of biodiversity loss. And here again, it is the rich countries that are overwhelmingly responsible for causing this problem. This is clear when we look at this graph, which shows per capita resource use by country income group. Again, the red line is the maximum sustainable level. We see that rich countries on the far right use on average about 28 tons of materials per person per year, which is four times over the maximum boundary, and by the way, vastly in excess of what we know is required to meet human needs at a good standard. Crucially, not all residents of rich countries are responsible for this. Richer individuals obviously consume more than working class people. But more importantly, let me emphasize this fact, these high levels of resource use are an effect and should be understood as an effect of an economic system that is organized around commodification and profits rather than around meeting human needs. So I want to emphasize this is not primarily a question of individual consumption, but a question of the underlying economic system. Okay? Meanwhile, lower income countries use a small fraction of this and remain well within sustainable levels. In most cases, they actually need to increase their use of resources in order to build the infrastructure required for human development, hospitals, houses, uh, electricity infrastructure, and so on. Okay, now, and here too, excess resource use in the global north represents a process of colonization. Let me explain, explain br briefly how this, how this works, okay? Here's the key facts. Growth in the global north relies on a massive net appropriation of resources from the global south. In other words, the world economy is characterized by a net flow from the south to the north, from periphery to core. In a recent paper published in Global Environmental Change, we calculated the full scale of net appropriation from the global south in empirical terms. And the results are quite staggering. I want to, to, to walk you through them briefly. First, 
a net total of 12 billion tons of embodied raw materials is appropriated from the South each year. And by embodied here, I mean the materials that are involved in the production of traded goods and services, okay? So to put this in perspective, 12 billion tons, that's double the total mass of resources extracted from the continent of Africa every year. This quantity is transferred to the North for free without any equivalent compensation every year. 21 exajoules of embodied energy is net appropriated from the South each year. To put this in perspective, that amount of energy would be enough to develop the infrastructure in the Global South required to provide healthcare, education, housing, heating, cooling, public transit, computing, and other essential necessities to the entire population of Africa, Asia, and Latin America, meeting human needs at a good standard. But instead, it is used to fuel corporate growth with the benefits landing in the Global North. 820 million hectares of embodied land is transferred from the South each year. To put this one in perspective, that is twice the size of the land mass of India. That amount of land could be used to provide nutritious food for four to six billion people, but instead it is used to produce things like sugar for Coca-Cola and beef for McDonald's, consumed in the Global North to the benefit of their corporations. And finally, 188 million person years of embodied labor is net appropriated from the South each year. That's nearly the size of Latin America's entire workforce. That labor could be used to staff hospitals and schools, to produce food and goods for local needs, but instead, that standing army of workers is working full time, year after year, churning out tech gadgets and fast fashion for northern companies. This is not a small thing. Our results show that growth in the global north depends utterly on this imperialist appropriation. It depends on sucking the life out of ecosystems and human communities in the global south. Now what this means is that the social and ecological impacts of northern growth are offshored or externalized to the global south. That is where the damage happens, at the resource frontiers. You don't see it in Spain or in Finland. You see it in Brazil, in Indonesia, in the Congo. Southern ecosystems and communities are plundered to support continued growth in the North. And this is the cause not only of environmental degradation in the Global South, but also of mass poverty and human deprivation. My colleagues and I calculated that the value appropriated from the South each year is equivalent to $10.8 trillion in Northern market prices which would be enough to end extreme poverty 70 times over. But instead, the South is maintained in conditions of misery to support and shore up the possibility of continued capitalist growth in the core. Okay. In other words, the dual crisis of ecological breakdown and mass poverty, the persistence of mass poverty, is an effect of imperialist appropriation in the world economy. So in a few minutes, I'm going to explain what's going on here, why and how these net flows occur. But first, I want to establish a broader point. I want to argue that imperialist appropriation along these lines is not incidental. It is a structurally necessary feature of capitalist growth. Okay? Remember, under capitalism, growth is not about increasing production to meet specific human needs. We established that. It is about increasing production with the goal of extracting and accumulating surplus value. That is the overriding objective. Capitalist production is organized around perpetual expansion for the sake of perpetual accumulation. Okay? Now, in order to sustain a process of perpetual expansion and accumulation, capital requires an ever-increasing quantity of inputs at the lowest possible price. To achieve this, capital has to find ways of cheapening labor and resources. Now, one option is you could sabotage your domestic resource base and your domestic working class by cutting protections on labor in the environment, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, this hurts people, and sooner or later, you're likely to face a revolution, right? If you want to avoid this, then you need, and, and furthermore, indeed, if you are under pressure from your domestic working class to improve their working conditions with a welfare state and fair wages, et cetera, et cetera, 
then your only option is to, is to sabotage some third party who is not in a position to fight back, right? You need some kind of outside, external to your system, where you can exploit resources and labor, more or less with impunity, and externalize the social and ecological damages of production, right? This is where the colonies come in. Capital has relied on forms of colonization for the entirety of its 500-year history. The two systems arise at the same time, required in order to keep input prices as low as possible. Imperialism is a structurally necessary feature of capitalist growth. Of course, this arrangement was obvious during the colonial period from the late 1400s onward. The rise of capitalism in Western Europe, we know, relied utterly on the appropriation of resources from the colonies and on the use of enslaved and indentured labor on a truly vast scale. I won't take time to spell this out here, but let it suffice to call to mind briefly the silver plundered from the Andes, the sugar and cotton grown on land appropriated from indigenous Americans, the grain, rubber and gold, and countless other resources appropriated from Asia and Africa. This global network of extractive industries enabled the economic rise of the imperialist states and underpins the Industrial Revolution. Now, this arrangement came under threat in the middle of the 20th century with the rise of the radical anti-colonial movements across Asia, Latin America, and, and Africa. Newly independent governments refused to be plundered any longer by northern capital, and they pursued strategies of economic sovereignty. <clears throat> Drawing on socialist principles, they sought to reclaim their resources and focus production on meeting domestic human needs. They used tariffs and capital controls to protect their markets. They used subsidies to support domestic industries. They used land reform to reclaim territory that had been appropriated by colonial firms. And they ensured better wages for workers by legalizing unionization for the first time. This approach succeeded marvelously at raising the incomes in the Global South and improving welfare. It was a kind of development miracle. But northern firms were not pleased as these progressive policies, while they were working for the people in the South, were cutting off their access to cheap labor and resources, which they had enjoyed and relied on during the colonial period. In other words, it caused the colonial arrangement to unravel. And this triggered a massive crisis of capitalism in the 1970s, which manifest at that time as stagflation, okay? Now, this is not surprising. After all, any significant increase in the price of Southern wages, resources, and goods, and any increase in the South's share of global consumption will be inherently inflationary for the North. In other words, it will constrain Northern consumption and constrain Northern growth. The unraveling of the colonial arrangements made capital accumulation in the North very difficult to sustain, especially given that, that wages were also rising in the North at the same time, thanks to the power of organized labor and the rise of the welfare state. Capitalism faced a crisis in the 1970s because it cannot function under conditions of global justice. The governments of the North faced a fork in the road. They could either accept a socialist and anti-imperialist South and decent wages at home and abandon capital accumulation, shifting to a post-capitalist economy. Or they could try to maintain capital accumulation by destroying the socialist movement at home and abroad and somehow restoring the basic structure of the imperial arrangements. They opted hardcore for the latter. We know how this played out in the West, in countries like the US and Britain, where unions were decimated and the welfare state was shredded, but it was in the global south that the real fury was unleashed. Imperialist states responded to the anti-colonial movements in two ways. First, they intervened militarily to depose anti-colonial leaders. The list is long, and it includes several figures that all of us should know. Mohammed Mossadegh, deposed in, uh, in 1953 in Iran by a Western-backed coup. Patrice Lumumba in the Congo, deposed in 1961 
by a Western-backed coup. Arbenz in Guatemala, deposed in 1954 by a Western-backed coup. Sukarno in Indonesia, deposed in 1967 by a Western-backed coup. Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana, deposed in 1973 by a Western-backed coup. Thomas Sankar, oh, <laughs> Salvador Allende in Chile, whom all of us know, deposed in 1973 by a Western-backed coup. Thomas Sankara in Burkina Faso, sorry about that, deposed in 1987 by a Western-backed coup, and many others who were unseated and replaced with right-wing dictators more amenable to Western economic interests and who proceeded to roll back the socialist reforms of the progressive era. But northern states also intervened by using the World Bank and the IMF to impose structural adjustment programs across the global south in the 1980s and 1990s. Okay. Structural adjustment forced governments to cut tariffs and subsidies, cut protections on labor and the environment, cut public spending, cut public sector employment. This was the sharp edge of neoliberal reform imposed more viciously on the global south than ever it was in the USA or Britain. The effect was to destroy the South's sovereignty and push the prices of labor and resources back down. It was sort of an invisible, uh, an invisible coup. Structural adjustments thus restored the imperial arrangements and rescued capitalism in the global north. It restored the rates of corporate profits and it restored the northern rate of growth. There's an important point to be made here, very briefly. Progressives quite often like to think of neoliberalism as the disease, and they yearn to return to some less rapacious version of capitalism that preceded it. But neoliberalism is not the disease. It is a symptom of the disease. The disease is capitalism. Neoliberalism was imposed because it was a necessary next step to keep capital accumulation afloat in the face of a resurgent South and a resurgent socialist movement in the global north. It was imposed in response to movements for global justice. Right. By undermining the South's attempts to achieve economic sovereignty, structural adjustment put Southern economies back into a position of being dependent on exports to and imports from the global north. But because SAPs also depressed prices in the global south at the same time. This means that for every unit of embodied resources and labor they import, they therefore have to export many more units to pay for it. That's how trade works. This is what we refer to as unequal exchange, and it generates the large net outflows of resources from south to north that I described earlier. This image here shows the unequal exchange of labor between the global south and the global north. The light gray bars at the top show the scale of southern imports of labor from the north, while the dark gray bars at the bottom show the scale of southern exports to the north. For every unit of embodied labor the south imports from the north, they have to export on average 13 units to pay for it. This reflects truly massive wage inequalities in the world economy. Under capitalism, southern labor is paid 1 13th that of northern labor. Not because they are less productive or, produ or because they produce less value. No, in fact, the opposite is true. Southern workers produce more units per hour than northern workers because they are compelled to work under extremely intense labor regimes, which is precisely why uh, labor-intensive production gets offshore to the south. They receive lower wages not because they are somehow naturally cheap, but because they have been cheapened. And this cheapening means that the core economies benefit from an enormous quantity of additional labor well beyond what their own populations could ever provide. Okay. The same is true for embodied raw materials. For every unit the South imports from the North, they have to export five to pay for it. The same is true for embodied land, where the ratio is again five to one. And the same is true for embodied energy, where the ratio is three to one. This is the form that imperialism takes in the 21st century. It is an arrangement that enables imperial appropriation without the need, in most cases, for military occupation. Now the question becomes, how could the World Bank and the IMF 
get away with imposing policies that were so clearly destructive to the global south. To answer this question, we need to recognize that the institutions of global economic governance are deeply undemocratic. There's a tendency in progressive circles to believe that the World Bank and the IMF were founded as progressive institutions, right, back in the 1940s. But in fact, they are colonial institutions, founded during the colonial period and with colonial principles in mind. The Global South countries were integrated into these institutions on fundamentally and purposefully unequal terms, and they remain fundamentally unequal to this day. The United States has veto power over all major decisions, and together with the rest of the G7, controls more than half of the votes. The Global South, which has the vast majority of the world's population, has only about one-third of the vote. If this was the case in any national parliaments, we would be outraged. We would call it apartheid. And yet apartheid principles operate right in the center of our global economic governance system. The core economies are able to determine the rules of, inter of the international system in their own interests. The imposition of structural adjustments on the global south was simply an outcome of imperial privilege. So the GDP of southern countries is low not because they produce little value. It's because their labor and their lands and their lives are cheapened. This happens through structural adjustment, as I've described, but that is not the only mechanism for cheapening. There are several others. It also happens through the exercise of monopsony power in global commodity chains. Lead firms like Apple are so dominant in their sectors that they can basically dictate prices to their suppliers in the global south, forcing them to keep wages at or even below subsistence. It also happens through monopoly power. More than 90% of all patents are owned by northern firms. So not only do they set prices for their suppliers, they can also set the prices of final sale. And of course, the difference between prices they pay and the prices they get is registered as GDP in the global north. This allows lead firms to appropriate value that is produced in the south, a pattern that is cemented by the patent rules that are enshrined in the World Trade Organization. And speaking of which, I should mention, finally, that the WTO itself is also deeply undemocratic. Bargaining power is determined by market size. So the countries that became rich during the colonial period are able to determine trade policies today in their own interests. Inequality begets inequality. Okay. Now I want to take a moment to underline a key conclusion that emerges from this. Okay. Which has to do with inequality. When neoclassical economists think about inequality, they assume that all the world's countries are on the same general trajectory of development. They're just at different stages. The poor countries of the South are just behind, but they'll be able to follow the same development tra trajectory of the US and Europe and eventually catch up to them, right? But once we understand that capitalist growth in the global North depends on imperialist appropriation, this narrative is revealed to be absurd. Catch-up development cannot occur within a system that is predicated on imperialist appropriation. It physically cannot occur in the context of, of net south-north flows, and it cannot occur within a system that relies on cheapening southern labor and resources. Saying that poor countries can catch up to rich countries is like, is like saying that Amazon workers can catch up with Jeff Bezos if they, if they just work hard enough, right? It's clearly absurd. This is why we see that the income gap between the global south and the global north has continued to increase since the end of colonialism, as we see in this graph. There's no catch-up development happening. And this is not because poor countries are behind. It is because they are exploited. This also allows us to have a different perspective on global poverty. Poverty in the global south is not some kind of natural condition. It's an effect of imperialist appropriation. It's an effect of price depression, which constrains southern income and consumption. And it's an effect of the rules of international trade and finance that preclude the South from using policies that we know would enable them to achieve sovereign development. And indeed, this is why we see that development success stories, 
only are ever really achieved to the extent that countries manage to claw back some degree of economic sovereignty and use state-led industrial policy, which we can see in the case of China, some of the South American countries, and for different geopolitical reasons, the East Asian tigers. But there's another reason to question catch-up narratives, and it has to do with ecology. Here's the key point. The high levels of resource use and energy use that characterize the core economies cannot be universalized. They cannot be universalized because they rely on net appropriation, but also because they are wildly in excess of sustainable boundaries. If all countries were to consume at the rate of the core economies, consume materials at the rate of the core economies, we would need four, four planets to sustain us. If all countries were to consume energy at the rate of the core economies, decarbonization in line with the Paris Agreement would be literally impossible. Indeed, we would be cruising for a future of guaranteed catastrophic climate breakdown. On the contrary, what is required if we were to have any chance of reversing ecological breakdown and achieving the Paris goals is that the core economies need to, act to actively and quite dramatically scale down their use of materials and energy. Let's start with materials. Rich countries need to scale down their use of the planet's resources by around 75% from existing levels. There is widespread agreement on this. The objective is even uh, ratified by the European Parliament. Now, the existing dominant discourse claims that this can be accomplished with green growth. The idea is that efficiency improvements will allow us to achieve an absolute decoupling of GDP from resource use, so that GDP can rise indefinitely even while resource use declines. It sounds wonderful. The only problem is that green growth narratives have little empirical support. There's little evidence of sustained absolute decoupling of GDP from materials, even despite dramatic improvements in technology and efficiency over the past few decades, and despite a shift to services. And all existing models project that it is unlikely to be achieved uh, in the future. The main reason for this is that in growth-focused economies, gains or savings from efficiency are reinvested to expand the process of production and consumption, which makes absolute reductions very difficult to achieve. In other words, it's not our technology that is the problem here. It's growth. What about climate? Remember, in order to stay under 1.5 degrees, we need to cut emissions to zero by 2050. High-income nations, given their disproportionate share of historical responsibility, must decarbonize much faster than this. Now, emissions are different from materials. We know that it is possible to absolutely decouple GDP from emissions by transitioning to lower carbon energy sources. Indeed, more than a dozen high-income nations have already achieved this, even when measuring emissions in consumption-based terms. This fact has been widely recruited to argue that not only is green growth possible, but according to the Financial Times, it's already here. Now what this discourse obscures is the fact that none of these countries are reducing emissions in line with what is required to stay under 1.5 degrees, or even well under two degrees as per the Paris Agreement. And certainly not when we account for what is required of the rich countries under conditions of equity. Existing trajectories and even existing planned trajectories are inadequate. <laughs> so the question becomes, is sufficiently rapid decarbonization possible? The answer is yes, but not if high-income nations continue to pursue growth at the same time. The reason is simply because growth is coupled to energy demands. So more growth means more energy demands than would otherwise be the case. This is a problem because more energy demands makes it more difficult and probably impossible to cover it with renewable alternatives in the short time we have left. Indeed, this is why climate action has so dramatically failed so far. This is why we're headed for three degrees. Politicians know this fact, but they cannot bring themselves to face it. In order to reconcile continued growth in rich countries with the Paris Agreement targets, 
they bet heavily on speculative negative emissions schemes to save us. The idea is that even if we overshoot the Paris Agreement uh, targets, that's okay because we can, we can pull excess emissions back out of the atmosphere later in the century, right? The problem is that scientists reject this assumption as highly dangerous. Without going into detail here, the main problem is that the technology has not been proven at scale. And if it fails, we'll be locked into a high temperature trajectory that will be impossible to escape. It's a massive gamble with the future of all of life on Earth, all to defend growth in the global north, which we don't even need. Furthermore, I should mention that the main negative emissions uh, technology that is under consideration is known as BECS, which stands for Bioenergy with Carbon Capture and Storage. This would require biofuel plantations around three times the size of India on lands appropriated overwhelmingly from the global south. In other words, this so-called solution relies on the assumption of continued imperial appropriation from the south. This is not morally or politically acceptable. Now, if we scale down our assumptions about negative emissions, then the evidence is clear that to stay under 1.5 degrees or well under two degrees, high income nations will need to dramatically reduce energy use. The less energy we use, the more quickly we can decarbonize. Okay. In light of this evidence, we need a fundamentally different approach. Yes, we need efficiency improvements, but this alone is not going to be enough. We also need to abandon growth as an objective and scale down less necessary forms of production in order to reduce energy and resource use directly. The first step is to realize that high-income nations do not need more growth. We must understand that growth is a metric of aggregate production as measured in terms of market prices, not in terms of use value. When it comes to human well-being, it's not aggregate production that matters. What matters is what we are producing. Is it private jets or is it housing? Whether people have access to essential goods, is the housing expensive or affordable? And how income is distributed to the rich or to the poor? That's what counts. So instead of assuming that every sector of the economy should grow all the time, regardless of whether or not we actually need it, we should decide what kinds of production we actually do need to increase things like renewable energy capacity, public transportation, and what kinds of production are clearly destructive and should be scaled down. SUVs, private cars, private jets, air travel, fast fashion, industrial beef, advertising, the practice of planned obsolescence, the military industrial complex, and so on. In capitalism, there's huge chunks of the economy that are organized mostly around expanding corporate power and elite consumption, and we would be better off without them. This is known as degrowth. Now, I want to clarify that degrowth is not anti-technology. On the contrary, degrowth scenarios embrace ambitious efficiency improvements to the extent that they are empirically feasible and socially just. Degrowth simply recognizes that efficiency alone is not enough. We also need a radical transition toward equity and sufficiency. Focus the economy around what is required to secure human well-being. Reduce inequality and scale down less necessary forms of production. This approach is powerful in terms of climate mitigation because it would significantly reduce energy demands and make it possible to achieve a rapid transition to renewables, fast enough to stay under 1.5 degrees. It also succeeds in bringing resource use down significantly thus stopping and even reversing ecological breakdown and biodiversity loss. This is incredibly hopeful news. Most people would regard this as sensible, except for one sticking point. What about jobs? What about livelihoods? As we scale down less necessary forms of production, won't that lead to unemployment? Clearly, that would be politically untenable. Nobody would agree to such a future, and nor should they. Fortunately, there's a simple solution. As the economy requires less labor, we can shorten the working week and share necessary work more evenly. We know that shorter working hours deliver big improvements in well-being, health, and gender equality, while at the same time dramatically reducing emissions. It also happens to be resoundingly popular. We can also roll out a climate job guarantee 
decentralized and democratic. Such a program would ensure that anyone can train to participate in, uh, in the most important collective projects of our generation, building renewable energy capacity, insulating homes, producing local food, providing social care, and regenerating ecosystems. Who wouldn't want to be part of this kind of work? This permanently ends unemployment and allows us to mobilize labor around use value rather than exchange value, around socially necessary objectives rather than around corporate profits. At the same time, we need to decommodify essential goods and expand universal public services. And here I mean not just healthcare and education, but also housing, public uh, transports, clean energy, water, internet, and nutritious food. This ensures that essential goods and services are always being produced and are always accessible, regardless of fluctuations in aggregate output. And by the way, it is also intrinsically deflationary in that it directly decreases the cost of living, an important intervention in today's economy. Next, democratize production. Public services should be democratically managed as much as possible, and control within private firms should be devolved to workers. We know that under conditions of direct democracy, people choose to focus production on meeting human needs and well-being while using resources more sustainably. Democracy is essential here. On top of this, we need to dramatically reduce inequality and distribute income more fairly. This is key. People often ask me whether there will be enough income in a degrowth scenario to meet everyone's needs. The answer is yes. By definition, yes. National income is by definition equal to the total prices of all the stuff that is produced and consumed in the economy. There is always exactly enough income to buy everything the economy produces. So long as we are producing what people need, then there will always, by definition, be enough income to buy it. As long as the income is distributed fairly, distribution is everything. Distribution will be automatically improved by the job guarantee and universal public services because these increase the bargaining power of labor. But we can further secure this outcome by introducing a living wage or a living income to raise the floor at the bottom while introducing a maximum income policy to put a ceiling at the top. Thomas Piketty has pointed out that cutting the purchasing power of the rich is one of the single most powerful climate policies we can deploy. It may sound radical, but in an era of ecological break breakdown, it is irrational and dangerous to devote resources and energy to supporting an overconsuming elite. Taking this approach, establishing a firm social guarantee and sharing resources more fairly, transitioning to an eco-socialist economy would allow us to ensure decent livelihoods for all and therefore de-link human well-being from growth. This stabilizes the economy and ends the growth imperative. It also breaks the political logjam that we presently suffer around climate action. Right now, we cannot pursue radical climate action because it might harm employment and livelihoods. By taking the question of employment and livelihoods off the table, securing them permanently, we can pursue radical climate action without anyone getting hurt. Nobody worries about it anymore. This is the bread and butter of a just transition. We need these policies. Without them, we're doomed. I want to emphasize that the demand for degrowth is not just about ecology. It's also essential to anti-colonial politics. We must end the colonial patterns of appropriation that underpin northern growth to release the South from the grip of extractivism and a future of catastrophic climate breakdown. Southern countries should be free to organize their resources and labor around meeting human needs rather than around servicing northern capital accumulation. Degrowth is, in other words, a demand for decolonization. It's important to recognize that degrowth scholarship builds on the legacy of anti-colonial thinkers. Franz Fanon, Gandhi, Julius Nyerere, Thomas Sankara, Berta Caceres, people who knew that capitalism in the North was driving colonization in the South. And this thinking is reflected clearly in the, in the People's Agreement of Cochabamba, signed in 2010 by thousands of social movements across the South calling for the governments of rich countries to cease 
their appropriation of the planet's commons, scale down their resource use, and decolonize the atmosphere. The Cochabamba statement is much more radical in coherence than anything that passes for analysis in mainstream Western discourse. If you have not read it, I urge you to do so. Uh, it becomes clear that social movements in the South recognize that ecological breakdown is being driven ultimately by capitalism. They recognize that it has clear imperial dimensions and they call for an anti-colonial struggle in response. It is incumbent on all of us here to stand in solidarity with this demand. As the 21st century unfolds, we must strive for a world where everyone can live healthy, dignified lives in balance with the planet's ecosystems. The good news is that we know empirically that it's feasible to meet the needs of a whole global population, 10 billion people at a good standard within planetary boundaries, but it requires a radical change in the world economy. Resource use in the global north needs to decline dramatically to get back to sustainable levels, while resources in the south must be reclaimed for meeting human needs with production increased where necessary to do so, converging at levels that are consistent with universal human welfare and ecological stability. What is this going to require? Well, it's going to require that the global north transitions out of capitalism and shifts to a democratic post-capitalist economy. This is crucial to obliterate the constant pressure for imperialist appropriation. But it is also crucial in order to make it feasible to meet the needs of northern citizens with significantly less resources and energy. Neither of these are possible in a capitalist economy. At the same time, we also clearly need uh, urgent structural changes to the world economy. Democratize the institutions of global economic, of economic governance so that southern governments have an equal voice in the decisions about trade and finance that affect them. Cancel odious or unpayable debts or introduce mechanisms for safe default to liberate southern governments to direct their resources toward human development objectives. End structural adjustment programs to allow southern governments to deploy the policies that are necessary for sovereign development, tariffs, subsidies, capital controls, nationalization, public spending. Social movements in the Global South have been calling for these reforms for decades. For too long, their demands have gone unheeded. But there's a problem. Capitalists in the Global North will not voluntarily make such a transition. Of course, we might hope that some enlightened leaders will take steps in this direction, or that radical social movements here will eventually force them to do so. This could certainly work, particularly if environmentalists are able to establish alliances with trade unions and other working class political formations, which is essential to the, to the success of this movement. And toward this end, foregrounding the social policies I described earlier is critical to speak directly to the question of working class livelihoods and economic security. This has to be secured. Clearly, we should do everything possible to move in this direction. We must build those social movements. We must build those alliances. But for the global south, ask yourself, why should they wait around for this to happen? Why should they wait around to be decolonized? There's an additional option. Southern governments can and should take steps to achieve unilateral decolonization delinking from exploitation by northern capital, by mobilizing their resources and labor to meet domestic human needs rather than to, to service the interests of northern corporations. This is not easy to achieve, but insights from modern monetary theory offer pathways for how it can be done, at least in the case of nations that have sovereign control over their own currency. The first step is to reduce dependence on northern imports. The biggest import categories are food and energy, Governments can issue the national currency to fund a strategy of food sovereignty, mobilizing land uh, to provide nutritious food for all, while at the same time pursuing a strategy of energy sovereignty by rolling out renewables. This would significantly reduce governments' needs for foreign currency 
and thus reduce their reliance on foreign capital, which is what puts them in conditions, in, uh, in a position where they are forced to accept structural adjustment. To mobilize labor for these projects, governments can issue currency to fund a public job guarantee. This would end um, uh, unemployment and ensure that everyone has access to a decent livelihood, therefore achieving a major development objective that has so far remained out of reach. If you have surplus labor, mobilize it around what people need. This is a very clear teaching of MMT. The third step is to build sovereign industrial capacity using tariffs, subsidies, nationalization, and capital controls where necessary to organize production around meeting domestic needs, to further reduce pressure for imports, and to participate in regional trade, which tends to be less exploitative. Okay, to the extent that any of these policies are prohibited by foreign creditors, which is quite often the case, governments can and should take steps to default on their external debts through collective action wherever possible. This might make borrowing in foreign currency more difficult for a short time, but because we are reducing our dependence on foreign currency, this doesn't matter as much as it otherwise might. Now, I want to emphasize that this also requires a transition out of capitalism in the global south. The reason that capitalism has failed to deliver development in the periphery is because capital has to cheapen inputs. In the periphery, capital does not generally have the option of externalizing exploitation, unlike the core states do. Okay? So capitalist states and firms have no choice but to try to compress wages domestically with violence where necessary. And this is why capitalist states in the South are quite often regress, uh, repressive of their own citizens and repressive of social movements because they do not have the privilege of using an imperial arrangement. Okay? So if the objective in the South is to increase wages and improve social conditions, it is easier to achieve these goals in a democratic post-capitalist economy, where again, production can be geared towards social goods. We know from Amartya Sen's work that when southern countries adopt socialist development policies, especially universal public provisioning systems, they are able to achieve big improvements in social outcomes, even with modest levels of output. Of course, this approach faces serious headwinds. Let's not kid ourselves. Many governments in the global south are captured by capitalist interests and the radical quorum that we had in the 1960s and 70s has been all but destroyed. So the anti-colonial movement must be rebuilt. This is happening already through grass, uh, grassroots social movements across the global south and in several states and international initiatives. But it is still nascent. The job of progressives in the global north and of those of you who care about international developments should be to align with and support these struggles and make every effort to defend them when they come under attack. So let me close by summarizing it like this. The vision of a just and ecological future is possible to achieve. It is physically possible to achieve. But it is not possible within the structure of the existing world economic system. And the sooner we face up to this fact, the better. It will require revolutionary change coming from social movements in the periphery, but also in the core, to bring this vision into reality. Thank you. some questions, I think, 10 minutes or 50 minutes. And in fact, yeah, just before starting, before, there were two questions that somebody in the audience asked me to put very briefly, somebody who, who came before. And he said, well, it's almost a, an obvious question after this talk. Do you find, the question is to you, do you find Marxist analysis useful for, under, for understanding the situation of biodiversity. No, it's very specific. Biodiversity and climate crisis. Uh, 
Can Marxists be used to manage the way out of this crisis? This is one question. The second <coughs> question that we were asked to put to you is that uh, Murray Bookchin, the ecologist Murray Bookchin, was not uh, a Marxist at the end of his life at least, he says, capitalists cannot be more be persuaded to limit growth than a human being can be persuaded to stop breathing. breathing. So, uh, so we, we agree to this, but what kind of society can we imagine uh, with a degree of planning sufficient to control the decline? to support a society with planning, state planning, or rather a society made up of small collectivities of another type, isn't it? Well, this is very much a Murray Bookchin kind of question. So this question, you don't have to answer them now, immediately. I think it would be better to, to collect if there are people who have very, if have the question, they're suffering from the questioning imperative. There, I start with you. Yes, but please make it short and very clever. Okay, so first of all, I really want to thank you for taking a stand in solidarity and out of a privileged position that you have, put in your privilege in favor of, of other realities. And I think that is a really brave and, and uh, unusual stance. Um, and I find it hard not to feel a mix of rage and grief and um, but also inspiration when I listen to you so my main question is uh, in order for you know I don't believe capitalists can be persuaded out of its uh, stance and you said that as well so my way of looking at it is that we need a different narrative we need a different mythological uh, approach uh, that needs to be um, coming out of you know, mass media and, and reaching out to a sufficiently large number of people to create a social you know, movement that will put pressure on capitalism. And I can't see how we're gonna do that because we are, I'm, I'm speaking from you know, a social movement perspective. I'm, I'm seeing when we're facing mass media which are you know, uh, under corporation in, interest, so how the hell are we going to create a narrative that is going to be able to reach the sufficient amount of people to make this vision that you are um, proposing really uh, <laughs> viable? That's my question. Perhaps another question and then whenever you want to talk, you talk. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jason. For your work and for the here, for your work and for the presentation, I enjoy it so much. Um, you mentioned uh, that growth, of course, is related to labor, energy, materials from the south that go to the north. But I wonder about uh, the crisis of energy we are living today, because crisis of energy and materials, because sooner or later, perhaps it's going to be impossible to continue the growth in the north, even extracting everything from the south. Maybe not so soon, but uh, maybe in a few years or decades at the most. So then I wonder if we need to talk about unfair growth, but also the possibility of unfair degrowth. Because you mentioned that uh, neoliberalism is the symptom, capitalism is the cause, I agree. But perhaps the problem is a system of oppression Capitalism is a system of oppression, but can change, can be another one. So, for example, another system of oppression that some people are thinking about is that this neo-fascism connected to perhaps a slavery, servitude, techno-feudalism, who knows? So, I agree with you, but it's just thinking, especially related to what I said, the crisis of energy, which is very heavy, because it's a structural thing. And I think, I wonder if you want to talk or reflect on that? Go ahead. No. Okay, uh, thanks very much. Um, let's see, so three questions, Just I'll try to respond very briefly. 
Yeah, so, so of course I'm inspired by Marxist thought. <laughs> Um, that's clear. I mean, I think that there's a, there's a really interesting movement of, uh, an intellectual movement that's exploring uh, democratic eco-socialism now, which I think is uh, very inspiring. Um, and this is simply, just to briefly define it, uh, an economy where production is organized around meeting human needs within planetary boundaries, um, where production is controlled democratically by workers and communities, um, with universal public services and a fair distribution of income. Right? This is my definition of democratic eco-socialism. Um, I suspect that, given that definition, most people would probably agree that's a good system. Whether or not they like the word eco-socialism, I don't know, so we think about that. Um, but it's not the only possibility for an alternative. Uh, various other alternatives have been promoted uh, under different names, under different banners from progressive movements in the Global South um, discussed today under the banner of the pluriverse. Uh, so, and I think they, they generally share the basic principles that I just outlined when defining democratic eco-socialism, but with different inspirations that I think that we can all benefit from. So let's not have a single story of the alternative, um, but agreeing on some core tenets, I think is quite important. Um, now what's interesting, and this, this answers, or this I hope doesn't actually doesn't answer at all your question, but I'll try. Uh, what's interesting about these policies that I've mentioned is that they're, they're extremely popular, okay? They poll very well uh, whenever we've seen surveys and poll results on them. Um, things like the job guarantee, shorter working week, universal public services, uh, living wages, reduced inequality, et cetera, et cetera. These are popular. Large majorities of people support these policies. So it is conceivable we could build a political movement around these policies that would be popular, right? Our existing political, political parties clearly do not have these policies in mind. So either we, we build movements that push them in this direction, or we establish new parties that are capable of winning elections and forcing existing incumbents out. I don't know what the best strategy is, um, but, but clearly what is required here is movement building on a scale that those of us of our generation, at least in the global north, are not familiar with, right? Our inspiration must come from things like the labor movements in the 1940s, uh, the movement for women's suffrage, the, the civil rights movement in the USA, the anti-colonial movements of the 1950s and 60s, etc. These were movements that changed the world. The poorest and weakest people on the planet changed the world, right? They didn't need fancy social media even. Uh, these, I think, are the, are, are the, are should be the source of our, of, of our inspiration. I think that means learning from their tactics, learning from their strategies. To the question of unfair degrowth, um, so fortunately, the easy answer is that degrowth is defined as fair, <laughs> in the sense of it is defined as uh, a planned reduction of less necessary forms of production conducted in a safe, just, and equitable way. The literature is quite clear on this. Of course, recessions can happen in an unfair way, and they all, almost always do. So we can't confuse recessions or any other kind of economic crisis that occurs under capitalism, such as an energy price crisis, et cetera, with degrowth, right? These are crises, we're experiencing crises produced by capitalism that occur because of capitalist relations, right? Um, so, yeah, so, uh, but what's interesting is that, it, it, it's, to, your, to your question, um, in response to the energy price crisis and the cost of living crisis, et cetera, et cetera, policies from degrowth can be very effective, right? Universal public services, would reduce the cost of living, um, right? Decommodifying core goods would, would reduce the cost of living. Uh, reducing less necessary forms of production would reduce energy use and therefore take pressure off of the energy system, reducing your reliance on uh, foreign states you might not like, uh, and also uh, therefore reducing prices as well, right? The solutions are here. They're, they're proposed by eco-socialist scholars. Um, and so it's bizarre to watch capitalists struggling to find answers for this question, and their answers basically come down to two things, right? Increase unemployment and sabotage wages. Cut public services. These are their solutions, right? We cannot stand for these solutions any longer. It's time for different strategies. Uh, so, um, but anyways, I, uh, I mean, Juan, I know you know all of this, so I'm not, I'm just using your questions to speak to the, to the people. <laughs> there was somebody there who wanted to it's not only yours, but... Yeah, uh, 
three brief questions. Well, <laughs> one, uh, you told us that between country inequality, when it comes to emissions, is the key dimension. What you relate to sort of this imperialism. At the same time, we know that between countries, income inequality has gone down dramatically the last decades, driven by China, Brazil, and so on. So, if income is that correlated with emissions, and you know what you told us about imperialism goes in the other direction, that, that seems inconsistent. What, what am I missing in, in that in that picture? The, the second thing about this sort of economic calculus of imperialism. So you simply told us that uh, the South uh, export land, energy, and labor-intensive product. What you haven't told us is that they probably import capital and knowledge-intensive products. So according to your framework, shall I interpret uh, like, you know, if the Chinese Communist Party that is importing capital from Germany is, you know, in a particularly cruel way expropriating and squeezing German brains. And, and well, the, this last one, if capitalism means perpetual growth, is Japan, which has essentially experienced zero growth the last three decades. So is Japan a non-capitalist country? Thank you. All right, good questions. Yeah. Should, we, should I answer? Uh, can I also? No, oh, sorry, no, because this question I think deserves. Because he's criticizing the speaker. Yes, I've been criticized. <laughs> I've been criticized by one of my own audience members. Um, yeah, so, so I'm, I, I didn't, I'm not sure I quite caught your first question, but it sounded like you were saying uh, isn't income inequality between countries decreasing? Is that what you were saying? So I'm saying that income inequality is between countries when. Uh, between countries. Uh, yes. Between countries is the most important dimension. So if oh, no, I mean, it's certainly not. No, no, no. So, um, okay, good. Okay, I, I think I understand now. So, uh, yes, income inequality between countries is increased according to the Gini coefficient, which is a relative measure of inequality. Um, now, in absolute terms, or using the absolute Gini, uh, which measures income gaps, uh, income inequality has continued to grow uh, between countries virtually everywhere. Um, now, there are clearly some countries in the global south that have managed to, uh, to improve their position in the world economy. There's no question. China is the obvious standout example. Um, but they have not done this within the rules of the world capitalist system, but rather by pushing against them wherever possible, right? Uh, pushing against northern patent rules. They've been using state-led uh, industrial policy, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, they, they've effectively continued to use policies that the South used in the 50s and 60s, um, whereas the rest of the, of the region was prevented from doing so after structural adjustments, right? So, and this is, of course, one of the reasons that China is not tolerable by, by Western politicians increasingly today, right? Uh, they've been upset about the fact that the communist revolution in China is the one place where it's, well, aside from Cuba, I guess, where socialism was allowed to continue in some form. Now, I'm no fan of the Communist Party of China, and actually, I think they've abandoned core socialist principles that they should actually have upheld, uh, but more on that later. Um, as far as the South uh, uh, importing capital and knowledge from, from Germany, uh, or some example like that, no? I mean, yes, of course, but uh, two, two things in response. Um, uh, no, it is not squeezing Germany. I don't think anyone would argue that Germany is being exploited by any country in the global south, right? To the best of my knowledge, this has never been a claim. Uh, now, um, it's true that many countries in the global south are, under position, are in a position where they're required to import capital that the, or, um, or, or knowledge that they could produce themselves, but are prevented from doing so by things like patent uh, restrictions. The same is true, actually, of capital. The reliance on foreign capital is an induced reliance, right? Induced in large part because of structural adjustment policies that restrict monetary sovereignty. This is critical. And this is, this is the argument that I was trying to make here is that we need more monetary sovereignty in the South so that they can uh, finance uh, domestic development without relying as much on foreign capital, okay? Um, is Japan a non-capitalist country? I don't think anybody would argue that. Um, is capitalism uh, uh, still surviving in Japan? 
Yeah, you know, it's getting by, I'd say. At the same time, you know, no country is like pur purely capitalist or a socialist. And what's clear is that Japan has used several really interesting policies to manage to, to maintain human well-being uh, despite a non-growing economy. But of course, Japan is also not what we're looking at as an example of what needs to happen. Uh, Japan has not been dramatically reducing their, their, uh, their material and energy use. Um, and so, and certainly that would pose additional problems for Japan, I think, if they wanted to maintain capital accumulation. But yeah, so I think that it's very interesting, actually, what you say, to, to look at, at examples of countries where, e even Spain, actually, where, um, where growth has been difficult to achieve uh, and how they've managed that socially, right? We can learn from that. I think we should. Uh, so we don't have to be uh, super cut and dry about it. I think we can learn where things are working. Um, and there are plenty of countries in the global south over the past several decades that during periods of declining output have managed to improve uh, social outcomes. And I think that, that we can learn lessons from them too. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, thank you for the talk. I think it was very interesting. I have one question about debt. Um, because you state um, in the global south, you suggest that um, we should like just um, remove part of their debts and um, not, not expect them to pay it back, which I understand because it comes from a colonial past, which, where it was built. Uh, but I was wondering, how do you look at debt if you um, remove the historical perspective? So just debt as a tool, as a monetary tool to, um, yeah, to, um, to give incentives to people to try something out. Um, because you, if you give debt in our current system, you expect an additional return which goes in, in the other way of the degrowth uh, ideas. So I was wondering what is your idea about this? Like, do you think debt can still be something part of our economy, but in a different way than that is designed now? Shall I answer? Okay. What is your question? Yeah. yeah, yeah, thanks very much, thank you. Um, so, so, so debt uh, is simply a transfer of finance with particular strings attached. Now, a transfer of finance is, is simply a transfer of some kind of purchasing power over labor and resources, right? So what you're effectively doing when you give somebody a loan is you're allowing them to have some kind of control over productive capacity in the economy, right, to do something with it. Um, so, uh, so yeah, uh, the difference being that you're not making a, a, an actual transfer, a de novo transfer, uh, a sui generis transfer. You're, you're claiming some share of their productive uh, output back for yourself, right? So um, the ability to give credit is, is an effect of privileges in the world economy, right? You have, uh, you have an excess of control over purchasing power over productive capacity, and you, you choose out of, out of your benevolence, let's say, this is the way it's imagined, um, to give it. But, um, but yeah, I don't think that uh, this is necessarily a good arrangement. <laughs> I think that's, um, that's, uh, that there should be a more even distribution of purchasing power in the, in the world economy in the first place. Um, and for the Global South, uh, which was my focus here, uh, this requires being able to, uh, to issue their own currency, to control their own labor and resources and productive capacity for their own purposes. A privilege that the core economies exercise regularly, and yet which is denied to most countries in the periphery, right? Uh, due to like imposed jet to, uh, debt to GDP ratios and so on. So this I think we need to address. Is there room for debt in a degrowth scenario? This is another dimension of your question. Um, this is an interesting question that several researchers are exploring right now actually, and has been explored a bit in the literature. Um, uh, one of the conclusions that seems to emerge from this is that you might be able to have some kind of uh, simple interest debt that would be sustainable, but compounding interest debt, maybe not, right? Uh, so maybe we think about that a bit, but I'm no expert in that particular field. You'd have to, you'd have to look at the literature that deals with that particular question. Yeah, thank you, that's a really important one. <clears throat> All right, we have to finish actually because of the, of the time and uh, no, be, <clears throat> so just to, I'll say something to finish, because sometimes, including myself, the degrowth movement has been criticized because it's a very Northern European or US Movement, I'm very worried about their own growing their own food and having their own means. 
you know, bicycling to work and so on. And, and of course, basic income for everybody, no? Well, I, I belong to this, I am from the north. But you mentioned Cochabamba 2010, which in fact failed because of the internal politics of Bolivia. But now, for instance, Gustavo Petro in Colombia, he's making a speech very much in the same tradition. And very few people in here, in Catalonia, clearly, are able, I think, as you are doing now, inspiring many of us, uh, to look at things from the logical point of view, which is the point of view of the majority of humankind, isn't it? Which is in the South. Many of these ideas about ecological and equal trade and so on also came from the South, from the old, from Previs, adding the ecological issue, or Maria Stella's Vampa, or Alberto Acosta, or Gudinas in Latin America. But this view from the South, in which we really are a minority in the world, uh, is a very, well, healthy politically, I think, but also very, uh, is according to the truth of the issue, isn't it? This is the real world. So from our point of view, thank you very much. And it wouldn't, one thing is that he was born, no, you were born in, in the south, isn't it? I was. In the extreme <laughs> south, meaning in South Africa, and you were raised there, and I suppose this has some, well, I don't want to do psychoanalysis, but this might have some <laughs> I, I should clarify, I was, I was not born in South Africa, I was born in Eswatini, which is a neighboring country to South, to South Africa. Well, yeah, but, yeah, but, but um, in, in, not in the country, but yeah, in the region. Yes, really. in the region. But it's true, no, I mean, I, even as a young boy, I was influenced by the anti-apartheid struggle that was happening next door, and by the anti-colonial movement, which was in full swing in this particular former British colony, uh, where the land is, remains in the hands of British corporations. Uh, so, um, and, and I thank my comrades there for their, for their teaching. <laughs> okay, thank you very much.